This video is brought to you by Captivating History. Imagine, if you will, what kind of life you would lead in ancient times. What would be the content of your personality if you traversed multiple centuries and landed in, say, ancient China? In recent years, China has been a land of controversies. With its booming industry, socialist ideas, and collectivist practices, it has a leftist ideology that does not sit well with a lot of people. Despite all that, there are a lot of similarities between the China of today and the China of yore. To understand how civilization has evolved in this part of the world, we must go back to the beginning. Before we take a tour of ancient China, we need a historical timeline, and since life in different eras looked vastly different, references to chronology would help us draw a clear picture. In local religious tradition, the Chinese lands came to life when Pangu, a deity, woke from slumber in a chaotic egg-shaped universe. He split the egg with his axe, giving birth to the black yin, the earth, and the white yang, the sky. The scientific reality, however, is quite different from mythology. The oldest fossil remains from China date to around 2 million years ago and indicate they are from Homo erectus. Approximately 200 to 250,000 years ago, man started to settle in China. When the Neolithic Revolution started around 8,000 to 10,000 years ago, people in China began developing an agricultural lifestyle, with rice and millet as the main crops. They also domesticated dogs and pigs, made crude ceramics, and used sophisticated tools like spears, arrows, hooks, and needles. The major early settlements of the Chinese ancestors were around the Wei River, south of present-day Beijing, and later extended south towards the Yangtze River the longest river in Asia. The banks of these rivers were made fertile by the nourishing material they brought from the plains in the east. The land between the two rivers was perfect for settlement. The Chinese were surrounded by thick jungles to the south, high mountains to the west, deserts to the north, and a vast ocean to the east. By the third millennium BCE, various cultures sprung up due to war and trade and started to merge into one melting pot. These proto-Chinese societies developed a defined hierarchy of kings and shamans on top and the working class, mostly farmers, on the bottom. The politics of this era is narrated by myths and folklore that were written quite later, so historians are divided on it. Between 2200 and 2100 BCE, a ruler named Yu took over the lands and united various tribes, imposed fair taxes, built roads, and distributed food, making China a land of welfare. By this time, the people had developed a calendar, showed early signs of writing, and built irrigation systems, all of which led to the growth of larger societies. Shortly after that, a clear separation between the elite and the commoners was achieved. The people left the egalitarian tribal systems completely and entered the Bronze Age by building palaces, temples, and other public works. By the 17th century BCE, the Shang Dynasty came into power. In their era, the Chinese made further advances with bronze making, improved their calendar, and organized their writing system. Food production rose as animal husbandry developed into a large-scale operation. Wars and the military became highly disciplined for their time. Archaeological finds from the golden era of the Shang Dynasty include finely made bronze items like wine cups, chalices, religious vessels, weapons, and chariot decorations. They were followed by the Zhao Dynasty. In this era, writing was standardized, ironworking was refined, and Confucianism and Taoism emerged as potent philosophies. In the Eastern Zhao Dynasty chronology, the period from 722 to 481 BCE is known as the Autumn and Spring Period. The following period that lasted until 221 BCE is called the Warring States Period. During the latter part of the former, the Zhao rulers were mostly puppets on the throne, and local nobles ruled most of the large states. According to Sima Qian, the ancient Chinese historian, a major change happened during this period. The old feudal system was abolished, and a meritocratic system was put in place, even for higher court official positions and important fiefs. All of this prompted an emphasis on intellectualism in the latter of the two periods. In this second period, the nobles openly fought among themselves for full control of China, regardless of the actual Zhao ruler. Around the year 221 BCE, the Qin Dynasty unified most of the states, marking the birth of imperial China. 
The Chinese started using iron frequently while continuing bronze working traditions in this era. Iron tools became cheap and popular for warfare, food production, and farming. During the Qin Dynasty, one ruler ordered the burning of books and the execution of scholars so that the Chinese people could develop a united identity. The Han Dynasty preceded the short lived dynasty, whose massive exports of silk would create the Silk Road that connected China to the Mediterranean. The Han period is generally considered a golden age for China, as it witnessed several famous generals and scientific advancements. The Han Dynasty eventually split into three kingdoms around 220 CE. Now that we have a basic understanding of ancient Chinese eras and how the civilization advanced from one to the next, let's get into the nitty-gritty of social life. From the time of the early Shang to the late Han period, China's social order, economy, bureaucracy, and everyday life transformed dramatically. The society of Shang was quite different from the society of Han, but there are some similarities. The sovereign was always at the top of the Chinese social hierarchy. The earliest historical rulers, not including mythical emperors, carried the titles of kings or, more specifically, Wang. In the early days, their role was twofold, religious and secular. As a religious authority, they were responsible for conducting rituals and ceremonies. On the other hand, their secular power was perceived in terms of wealth and the ability to command the human resources of the commoners. Over time, their control over their subjects intensified. During the Zhao dynasty, they started to abandon their religious role as well, leaving them to priests. Wanting to share less and less power with the nobles, the Zhao dynasty also wanted to further their prerogative, so they introduced the theocratic mandate. The king of Qin would use this authority, which was given and confirmed by heaven, to do as he pleased. His unified kingdom consisted of almost the entire Chinese land, and the mandate of heaven gave him the freedom to do away with his ceremonial roles and directly interfere with people's lives. This consolidation of power can be understood by looking at the role of the nobles, officials, and administrations over the years. Initially, the courts were filled with feudal nobles who owned land and had rights to do with it as they saw fit. Their only duties were to pay tributes and wage wars when commanded. Over the centuries, the sovereigns worked on revoking feudal titles and creating a bureaucratic government. The process was completed with the establishment of the Qin Empire in 221 BCE, but the Han Dynasty later introduced an exception for members of the royal family. The greatest distinction between the nobles and the officials was that the former was hereditary, while the emperor appointed the latter. For its time, the Chinese hierarchy had far more vertical social mobility. Wealthier people were still at an advantage since they had access to better education, resources, and connections. However, as the societies grew more complex, merchants, landowners, and industrialists became increasingly prominent and were valued just below nobles and officials. The entire land went through an industrialization phase during which landowners would hire a workforce to earn capital. Industrialists often dealt with the mining of metals, salt extraction, large-scale manufacturing, and animal breeding. Itinerant merchants traded valuable commodities across a network of cities in China. Below the industrialists and merchants were artisans, who were valued for their skills in creating weapons, jewelry, and other products. Their status was directly proportional to their skills. Underneath the artisans in the social hierarchy were local traders and small merchants. Except for the booksellers and apothecaries, who were seen as worthy professionals by scholars, the gentry despised them. Ironically, farming was the only manual labor respected by the elites, and farmers were even held in higher esteem than artisans. Most of the population consisted of farmers, and the government tried its best to keep it that way. According to Confucius, the entire society depended on farmers, as they were the providers and hence a source of survival. During the Warring States period, a social group of retainers or clients became common, providing labor and lodging services. The lowest social order was that of the slaves, who were owned by their masters. Slaves were not a substantial part of Chinese society. In the Han period, maybe only 5% of the total population were slaves. The heads of families arranged marriages, and the wife would become part of her husband's clan. Women had some protection by the law. They were excluded from corvée labor, which is unpaid forced labor, and by Han times, women could own land in their own right. 
Before the Shang Dynasty, the cultural development of the Chinese was considerably inferior to Egyptians, Mesopotamians, and even Hindus. However, from that point onward, it started to accelerate. The most important aspect of Chinese culture has been the mythology and folklore of ancient China. The core beliefs of the Chinese people lay in the veneration of nature and balance, practicing divination and exorcism, and worshipping deities, spirits, and ancestors. These beliefs were, and still are, expressed through rituals and ceremonies. Confucius believed that humans are capable of, and even inclined, to do good. If only people focused on subjective as well as collective improvement, they could start the journey towards balance and harmony. Confucianism has continued to grow alongside Chinese mythology. As the state evolved, the folk religion may have lost its significance in the higher echelons of the government, but it remains a vital part of everyday life. In the same era as Confucius, Lao Tzu laid the foundations for Taoism, a philosophy that claimed that harmony lay in the pursuit of Tao, or the Way in contrast to Confucius's behaviorist model. The late spring and autumn and early warring states period were the high point of Chinese philosophy. The writing system matured in the early Han era. Literacy was not widespread, but the scholarly classes wrote works of art. They composed poems and wrote down stories. Down the line, authors like Sima Qian contributed to ancient Chinese literature in a seminal way. Poems were intended to be performed with musical accompaniment. Dances also accompanied ceremonial court music. Paintings, sculptures, and other visual arts were mostly used as decorations. Focusing on the culture of the ancient Chinese people, one realizes that it evolved from a religious background that soon developed into an earthly and practical system. The makeup of Chinese culture that emerged during the Han era remains intact today. One must not judge another time and place with a modern lens. Many ideas like liberalism, democracy, and even human rights did not exist in the world until just a couple or so centuries ago. Those old worlds existed in their independent hermetic rhythm, just as our world exists in its own. When looking back, we must do so with an eye for appreciation. To learn more about what it was like to live in ancient China, check out our book, Ancient China, a captivating guide to the ancient history of China and the Chinese civilization starting from the Shang Dynasty to the fall of the Han Dynasty. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and audiobook. Also, grab your free mythology ebook while they're still available. All links are in the description. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.